Hello everyone. My names are Jared Mosotti from the School of uh, Business and Economics, Department of Accounting and Finance, Mount Kenya University. I'm presenting Financial Management 2 and our topic of discussion is capital budgeting. In Financial Management 1, we had discussed about capital budgeting and in Financial Management 2, we continue to focus on key areas that have not been touched in Financial Management 1. Therefore, this is a continuation of what we had done in Financial Management 1. So just to remind you, capital budgeting deals with the allocation of funds to competing projects that involve the commitment of funds that will expect to generate benefits to an organization. In our previous uh, class on the same, we had looked at the key features and aspects of uh, capital budgeting. In this class, we'll start by looking at the steps involved in making an investment uh, decision. So the key decisions, the key steps have been highlighted there. We'll be focusing on generating the investment proposals. We'll also focus on estimating the future cash flows, then evaluating the cash flows, then making the selection decisions and the implementation. Then lastly, we'll be looking at the evaluation of the implemented uh, decision. The first step is generating the investment uh, proposal. Now, usually, the generation of a proposal is not ideally done by finance. It stems from other departments or sections within an organization. For example, we can have marketing department. They will generate a proposal on a new product. Now, these are products that can be developed by the firm. We can also have uh, our research and development department uh, coming up with uh, a proposal on developing or coming up with new technology. We can also have uh, other external sources like the government and the competitors uh, giving us an idea on what can be done within the organization. So when generating the investment proposal, basically the finance will rely entirely on other sections or other departments uh, other than itself. So the next step is estimating the cash flows. Now this is where uh, finance comes in heavily. Now when we talk about the cash flows, we are looking at the incremental cash flows after tax. Ideally, we know that all cash flows must be taxed, and therefore our focus is what eventually lands into the pockets of the company. We are interested in operating our cash flows as opposed to the financing cash flows. Now, when calculating the incremental cash flows, it is important to look at three basic uh, categories of cash flows. One is the initial cash flow, what we refer to as the outflow or outlay. The second one is the interim incremental net cash flows. Then the last one is the terminal year incremental net cash flows. Now, the initial cash outflow is basically the initial investment. That is, the amount of money the company will invest in the project. Then, the interim incremental net cash flows are the expected cash flows from year one to the almost last year. That means, apart from the last year, all other cash flows fall under the interim incremental net cash uh, flows. Then the terminal year incremental net cash flow will focus on 
what comes to the farm at the end of the useful life of the project. Now we look at the basic format for determining the initial cash flows. We start with the looking at the cost of the new asset. Uh, all assets have their cost price. That is basically the amount of money we pay to acquire the asset. Then to that we add uh, the capitalized expenditures. For example, we can have the installation costs. If the asset has been imported, we have the shipping costs. Then we can have, to that we can add or subtract the increase or decrease in the level of net working capital that is brought about by the new uh, investment. Then to that we minus the net proceeds from sale of all assets. Now this takes place if we are buying an asset to replace an existing asset. Then to that we can add or subtract the tax savings due to the sale of the old asset. We know that the old asset was generating some income and that income was subject to taxation and because of that any tax we are going to be saved because of selling of the old asset must be factored in when computing the initial cash flow. So after that, when we have added and subtracted everything, what we get is the initial cash outflow. Then we have the basic format for determining the interim and the terminal incremental net cash flows. Now we have the net increase or decrease in the operating revenue. You less or you add any net increase or decrease in the operating expenses, excluding uh, depreciation. Then to that, you add the increase or decrease in depreciation charges. Then you, that will give us the net change in income before, before taxes. Then to that, you can add or subtract the increase or decrease in taxes. Then what you get is the net change in income after uh, taxes. Then to this you can add or subtract the net increase or decrease in the tax depreciation uh, charges. Then this gives us the incremental cash flow for the terminal year before the project winds up. Then you can add or subtract the final salvage value. Salvage here means the disposal value of the asset at the end of its useful uh, life. Then you can subtract or add the tax or tax savings due to the sale or disposal of the new asset. Then lastly you can add or subtract the decrease or increase in the level of net working capital. That will give you now the terminal year incremental net cash flow. Now you have to note that uh, I have labeled them from A up to K. Now, items A up to G will represent the interim cash flows, and uh, H and K will represent the terminal year net cash flows. Now, we are going to use a simple example to show how we can compute uh, the cash flow, the net cash flow of our project. Now we have two examples. We are going to have asset expansion and later we can look at the uh, asset replacement. Now we assume we have a farm there that is uh, Lake Victoria uh, Fish Limited and it is considering buying a new facility that will cost 90,000 uh, Kenya shillings. And then it has a useful life of four years and a salvage value of 16,500. And then we have the installation costs that equals to uh, 10,000. Now in accounting one, you have done depreciation. Uh, therefore, at this level, I know when I talk about accelerated depreciation, we are together. So assume this firm will be using accelerated depreciation at the rate of year one, that 3.33 percent, year two, 44.45 percent, year three, 14.81. 
and year 5, 7.41. Now further, you assume uh, the machinery will be housed at an abandoned warehouse with no alternative use. Then the facility is expected to generate additional net operating revenue before depreciation and the taxes as follows. Year 1, we'll expect a net cash flow of 35,165. Year 2, we expect a net cash flow of 36,250. Year 3, we expect 55,725. Year 4, we expect 32,258. Now, in this example, assume the tax rate is 40%. Assume the tax rate is 40 uh, percent. Now, let us start by estimating the initial cash flow of this asset. One, we know the cost of the new asset is 90,000. Then we have the capitalized expenditures. Uh, in this case, we have shipping and installation. All of them are giving us 10,000. So the initial cash outflow for the entire project will be 100,000. Now let us look at the second step where we calculate the interim incremental net cash flows. Now we have net operating revenues excluding depreciation. These are the ones we are talking about, the net cash flows. Those are the ones coming in without factoring in depreciation. Now, for year one, it is given there, year two, up to year four. Then we have depreciation charge. The cost of this asset is 100,000. And for year one, depreciation is 33.33%. .33%, therefore, that 3.33% of 100,000 will give us 33,330. Year two, our rate is 44.45%. You apply that on our cost, which is 100,000, it gives us 44,450. Then year three, the same, year four. Now, we put these figures in brackets because we are subtracting them. So for year one, you subtract the net operating revenue, you minus the depreciation charge, it will give you the net charge in income before we apply taxation. The same now will be done for year two, year three, up to year four. Then you had or subtract the net increase in taxes. The tax rate is uh, 40 uh, percent. Now you notice that uh, all these charges will be reduced they will reduce your earnings if you are going to be charged tax. When you have a loss like this, they will, re they will increase your earnings. Therefore, the ones we are put in brackets will reduce. The one which is not in bracket is going to be added. So the net charge in income after tax for this one, you minus 735, you minus from 1, 1,837, you will get 1,102. If you look at year two, the increase in tax is not in bracket. Therefore, we are still going to subtract and it is going to reduce the amount of tax from, you could have gotten a loss of that. Now the loss has been reduced to 4,920. Now, these others are the same as year one. Then we have now our depreciation charges. We add them back because we want to know how much money actually came in. So to the figure which you got, you add that three, 330, 330, that is giving you a net incremental cash flow of 34, 432,000. Now, year one, year two, year three, we have not put them in uh, historic because the figures are going to be taken the way they are. But for year four, 
because it is the terminal year, we must factor in the disposal value of uh, that asset. Therefore, in our case here, we look at the final year. That is the year of winding up the concern. The figure we have calculated from our previous example is 22,319. When we go down here, we have the final salvage value of the new asset. The figure we were given in the question is 16,500. Now, we have the tax due to the sale of new asset. To this, you are going to apply 40%. The tax benefit comes because of the tax rate, which is 40%. When you apply the 40% on that, you get 6,600. Therefore, the terminal year in incremental net cash flows will be, you add this plus this minus this, is going to give us 32,219. So having done that, how much money do we expect now? In year one, we have, sorry, year zero, we have a cash outflow of 100,000. Year one, the figure we have just gotten is 34, 432. Year, three is, uh, year two is 39,530. Then year three is 39,359. And for year four, we now put the figure which we have got, which is the amount of money that came in plus the salvage value of the asset. We look at a second example now that is involving asset replacement. Now, the same company again is considering purchasing a new fishing boat to replace an old one and wishes to obtain a cash flow information to evaluate the project. Now, the purchase price is, in terms of dollars now, 18500 and the shipping costs $1,500. The old fishing boat has a remaining useful life of two years and may be sold at its depreciated tax book value of $2,000. The old boat will have no salvage value at the end of its useful life. Then the new boat will produce cash savings of 7,100 per year before taxes for the next uh, four years, after which it will not have any salvage value, no cash savings. Now assume the old boat was originally bought for 9,000, including uh, capitalized expenditures and further the accelerated depreciation of 33.3 3%, 44 44.45%, 14.81, and 7.41% is used, and a tax rate of uh, 40%. You are required to determine the cash flow of this uh, project. Now, step one, like we did in the previous case, we look at the initial cash outflow. We start with the cost of the new asset, which is 18500 then we have the capitalized expenditures. Uh, in this case, we have the fishing, sorry, the, the shipping uh, costs. That is $1,500. Then we have the net proceeds from the sale of the old boat. Now, unlike the previous case, here we already have uh, an asset that is being replaced and it is being sold. Therefore, uh, the proceeds from the sale has to be factored in. Therefore, when you factor in everything, uh, the initial cash outflow is going to be 18,000 because we have added the cost of the new asset plus the capitalized expenditures. We have subtracted the net proceeds from the sale of all the bought, and also we do not have any uh, tax savings. Therefore, the initial cash outflow of this asset is going to be 18,000. Now we estimate the difference in depreciation resulting from acceptance of the project. Now, when you look at the new boat, I take you back again. The cost is 18,500. Capitalized expenditure, 1,500. Therefore, if you add these two, you get 20,000. 
That is where we are getting the 20,000 from here. Then we apply accelerated depreciation on the figures that we have here. This one you multiply by 33.33%. This one you multiply by 44.45%. This one you multiply by 14.81%. This one you multiply by 7.41%. So the depreciation for the new boat will be 6,600 and the figures will be there. Now we have the old boat, depreciable basis. The initial cost of the old boat was 9,000. You are being told it has only a useful remaining life of two years. Therefore, from the year of purchase of the new asset, we will have year one and year two. After that, the old asset is assumed to have uh, not been there. Therefore, the old boat remaining depreciation will be for year one. Now, in the old boat, it is not year one but year four, year three, sorry, and this will be year four because it is having only two years remaining. Now, if you look at the depreciation rates for year four, year three is 14.81, year four is 0.741. Those are the ones we are using here because the old boat is remaining with two years. Therefore, this is year three, year four depreciation. Therefore, the old boat remaining depreciation will be year 3, 1,333, which will coincide with the year 1 of the new boat. Then year 4 for the old boat will coincide with the year 2 of the old boat, and the figure is 667. Now, the net increase in depreciation of the new boat minus the depreciation of the old boat, that is, 666 minus 133, you get the figure of 5,300. For year two, this figure minus this one, you get that. And these other years, we didn't have the old boat, therefore, the figure remains uh, the same. Now, we calculate the interim incremental net cash flows. We have year one to year three, like we did earlier on. And remember year four, we are going to calculate the terminal value of the asset. Now, the new board is going to bring a revenue of 7,100, all the figures being in dollars. You minus the depreciation, which we have just calculated, then you get the net change in income before tax, the figure which we have got there. Then you have the net increase or decrease in taxation. Now again, you notice whenever we are having a loss, the tax advantage will be there. Then we have the net change in income after taxes. Uh, this minus this, you get that. This, you minus this, you get that. You get the figures like that. Then you add back depreciation. Why are we adding back depreciation? because it does not involve a cash outflow. We provide for depreciation, but money has not moved out of the organization. Therefore, you add this to the figure which you add earlier on, which is 1060, and you are getting 63.93 for year one. For year two, you can see the figure there was a negative. You add to 82.23, you get the figure there. Now for year four, Remember again what we did, the incremental cash flow is 4,853. 4, then we have the final salvage value, which is zero. And because of that, the tax saving will also be zero. Therefore, the terminal year incremental net cash flow still remains the same. Therefore, it is not affected. So what is the expected incremental cash flows for the project? Year zero, an outflow of 18,000, year one, 6,393, year two, year three, and year four, the figures are given there. So having seen how we uh, estimate the cash flows of any project, the next step is evaluating 
the projects. In financial management one, we have done the methods. You remember the non-discounted methods? We had the accounting rate of return, the payback period. We had the NPV, that is the net present value, the internal rate of return, and the profitability index. We are not going to go through them. However, in the event we have a conflict in any of them, we use what we call modified internal rate of return. The modified rate of return is known as MIRR. Now, we use this method whenever there is a conflict in the other methods, and therefore it can be used to resolve any such uh, conflicts. The formula is given there. Uh, you will find uh, the, the variables are given there. This is the modified internal rate of return. Then here we have the future value of cash inflows. Uh, when we talk about that, we are referring to the terminal cash flows. Then we have the present value of the cash outflows, or what is known as the outlay. And then we have N, which is the number of periods, or the life of the project. So if you find the square root or the cube root, depending on the number of years of the future value of the cash flows divided by the present value of the cash flows, then you minus one, it will give you the modified internal rate of return. Now you accept this project if the modified internal rate of return you get is higher than the cost of capital. Now, how do we compute uh, the modified internal rate of return? Uh, you start with stage one, where you take the cash flows from the first to the last year and they compound them forward using the firm's cost of capital uh, as the compounding factor. Then to this value, uh, uh, sorry, you add the, the answers you get. That will give you the terminal value of the project. Then you go to stage two, you compute the present value of the cash outflows. Then you go to stage three now, you apply the formula that we have already seen up there to compute the modified internal rate of return. Then stage four, you interpret your, your results. We can use a very simple illustration. Mr. Change is considering an investment of Kenya shillings 260,000 in a startup. The cost of capital for the investment is 13,000 and uh, the cash flows expected are given down here. We have year zero, which is the current year. And you notice the figure is in bracket. It means it is a cash outflow. Then we have year one to year three the figures are given there. Now you are required to calculate the uh, MIRR for the proposed investment, and then you interpret your, your answers. Now we go to stage one, where you do the computation of the terminal values. Now here we have the columns. We have the cash, uh, the cash flows. Then we have the duration, we have the rate, we have the workings, and then we have the terminal value. Now, here we are having only cash inflows. That is why we do not have uh, the first, the zero year uh, cash flow. Now, we assume that the money that is received in year one, we go up there again, Year one, we receive 60,000. We assume that once the firm receives this money, it is going to invest this money. And if this money is invested, it is going to generate income for year two and year three. Therefore, the earnings expected from 60,000 will be for two years. That is the second and the third year, we will get money that we invested, uh, sorry, we will get uh, an income as a result of investing uh, 60,000. If you notice again year two, we have 100,000. But this money can only be invested for one year. So 
our income for 100,000 will be for one year. Then for year three, our income is assumed to come in at the end of the year. Therefore, we are not going to invest it. Now we go back here. The duration of investment is two years, which I've just told you. And assume the investment is giving us an, a return equivalent to the cost of capital of this farm. Therefore, we are applying 13%. The 100,000 I've just told you is one year there, and the same rate will be applied. Then for the third year, we are not going to invest. Therefore, the 13% on zero will still not give us anything. Now we go to our workings. Uh, if you invest 60,000 for two years, what do you get? You add 1 plus 1.13, that is giving us 1.13, then you square that, that is going to be our factor of compounding, and therefore we have 76,614. For year two, we are not going to square that, just 1.13, it's giving us 113,000. When you add, what you are going to get as a result of investing the 60,000, plus what you are going to get as a result of investing 100,000, plus the 200,000 as it is, it is giving us 389,614. Then, we look at the second stage, where you compute the present value of cash outflows. If you invest 260,000, the present value of 260 is going to be 260,000. Therefore now we have our terminal value of the cash inflows and we also have the terminal value of the cash outflows. When we get the cube root of that, it comes to 1.144434. When you minus 1, what is going to give you is 14.43%. Uh, so our modified internal rate of return for this project will be 14.43%. Now, is Mr. Change going to invest in this project or not? We go to the interpretation stage. We have got an answer of 14.433%, which happens to be higher than the cost of our capital, which is 13%. Therefore, advise Mr. Change to invest in this uh, project. Our next section in our discussion on capital budgeting is the effect of inflation on capital budgeting. So we are focusing now on inflation in capital budgeting. What is inflation? Inflation here means the general increase in the price levels leading to a general decline in the value of money. There are three important cash flows we are going to, sorry, two important cash flows we are going to be concerned with. One is the nominal cash flows or the money cash flows and the other one is the real uh, cash flows. When we talk about the rates, we are going to focus on three important rates. We have the money discount rates, we have the real discounting rate, and we have the rate of inflation. Those are the ones we are going to uh, look at. Now, when we talk about the nominal rate, it's represented by small m. It means uh, a rate uh, that has not been adjusted to the rate of inflation. Then, when we talk about rate of inflation i, we look at the inflation rate at a prevailing uh, period or the period under study. Then when we look at the real or required interest rate, which is represented by small r, we are looking at the rate of uh, return that has been adjusted to the rate of uh, inflation. Now when we use the rates given there, we have two types of cash flows. One is the nominal or money cash flow that looks at the actual amount of money that our farm has received or paid. When we look at the real cash flows, uh, we are looking at the cash flow that has been adjusted to uh, the rate of inflation. Now, if we look at the equation, we have 1 plus m is equals to 1 plus r into brackets 
1 plus i. Now, just to look at the variables again, m was standing for the money rate, then r, this one is the required rate of return, i is the inflation rate. How is it applied now in uh, capital budgeting? A project has the following cash flows before allowing for inflation. We have year one, sorry, we have year zero, year one, year two, and year three. And these are the cash flows. Uh, we have the cash outflow and the cash inflows. Then you are told uh, the money discounting rate is 15.5%, while the general inflation rate is 5%, and it's expected to remain uh, constant. Now you are required to evaluate the project if, number one, real cash flows and real discount rates are used. Two, uh, money cash flows and money discount rates are used. Now, what we are not given is R. M is 15.5%, I is 5%, R is not given. When we go back to our formula, our equation 1 plus M is equals to 1 plus R into brackets, 1 plus I. Now, if we make R the subject, you will find it is now going to be 1 plus M divided by 1 plus I into brackets minus, minus 1. So we substitute M with 15.5% and I with 5%. So what do we have? 1 plus 0 0.1555 divided by 1 plus 0 0.05, then you minus 1. If you do that, first you'll get 1.1. .1. When you minus 1, you get 0 0.1, which is the same as 10%. So our R is going to be uh, 10%. Now we start by looking at the real cash flows and the real discounting rates. Year 1, so, sorry, year 0, year 1, 2, 3. Then we have the real cash flows, the way they were given in the question. Then these are the discounting factors. The discounting factors, we had discussed them uh, earlier. So we are talking about the present value discounting factor uh, at the rate of 10% for n years. For year 0, it's going to be 1.0. For year two, when the interest rate is 10%, is 0 0.9091, and all of them are given there. You need not to be worried about these factors because you are given the same in our PV tables and FV tables. Now, this is column two, and this is column three. To get the figures in column four, you multiply column two by column three. So in this case, we multiply this by this. It is giving us this. You multiply this by that, it gives you this. You multiply this by that, it gives you that. You multiply this by that, it gives you that. Then you add everything. Remember this is negative, so you are adding a negative plus three positives. This is giving us 152 NPV. So our NPV is 152. Uh, see them there, but it's 152. All right. If we use the money cash flows and the money discounting factor, we have the same columns, but this time we are now factoring in inflation. If we factor in inflation for year one, you can see now the value of our money has gone down. You can see here again the value has gone down, but for year zero it remains the same because our shilling today is equivalent to one shilling. But a shilling tomorrow will have a lower value than a shilling today. So the difference between the earlier table and this one, we have now inserted the inflation. And with the real cash flow, when we put in now the inflation rate, we are going to have the money cash flows. Then we are now using the real the money discount rate the discount rate factoring in now the rate of inflation and we got 
that to be 15.5, which is the same as 0 0.155. So to get that, it will be 1 plus 0 0.115 into brackets raised to power n. So in our first case, this will be, our n will be 1, then 2, 3 like that. Then for each case, we are going to have the figures. Now, if you get the figure which we have already computed and gotten, you multiply the money cash flows with the money discount rate, you get the answer there. You multiply this by that, you get the answer there, you do that. And if you add the figures now in column 6, you get the same answer which is 152 as our net present value. Therefore, first, we invest in this project because it has a positive NPV. Then something else, as long as we are applying the same rate of inflation, our NPV will be the same as what you get when you are using uh, the real discount, when you are using the real cash flows and the real discount rates. You got 152, and in this other case, we have also gotten 152. Now, we have the varying impact of inflation. In some cases, we can have a different rate of inflation for different costs. And we can also have a different uh, rate of inflation for costs and a different for uh, revenues. That means if they are not constant, then it means you will have to apply the rate of inflation for costs, then you will have to apply the rate of inflation for uh, revenues. This can be illustrated by this example here. We have an investment of 50,000 that is expected to generate an annual cash flow of 75,000 as a result of additional costs of 40,000 per annum for three years. Now, the figures you are given are in uh, terms of real cash uh, flows. Then the inflation rate is 10% for revenues and 13% for uh, costs for each year. Then the appropriate money cost of capital is 24.3%. You are required to evaluate the project using NPV. So we start with the first one. We have the revenues, which are 75. The inflation rate for revenue is 10%. So for year one, you will have that. For year two and for year three, then the money cash flow now, you multiply this figure with that, you get this. This one with that, you get this one. Then for the costs, these are the costs, 40,000 each. The inflation rate for cost is 13%. Therefore, to get the money uh, cash flow, you multiply uh, the cost plus the rate of inflation. So you multiply this by that, it gives you that. Multiply this by that, it gives you that. Multiply this by that, it's giving you the figure there. Then now you get the net cash flows. The net cash flows, you are going to minus the money cash flow for the costs from the money cash flow for the revenues. So like in the first case, we minus 45,200 from 82,500, you get 37,300. Second column, the same, you get the answer there. Uh, the third row, sorry, you get that. You get the answers there. Then that is not the end of that question. We have been told the cost, the money cost of capital is 24.3%. Therefore, now the answers you have here, you apply a discounting factor of 24.3% for all of them. When you go to your tables, you can get that. Uh, when the discount rate is 24.3%, year one you get this, year two you get that, year three you get that. So multiply this by that, you get the answer there. This by that, you get the answer. This by that, you get the answer there. Once you have done that, you add all the figures, then they'll give you the, uh, the PV 
for the the costs sorry the pv for the cash in inflows that is the revenue then you less the initial outlay the initial outlay of this project is 50000 so to when you do the subtraction there you get 27611 as your npv which is positive therefore the decision is accept the project because the npv is uh, positive our next section is capital rationing now uh, when we were looking at the various uses of capital budgeting we had seen that one of the areas where it is applied is in determining how the scarce resources are utilized within a farm so in capital rationing we are going to use profitability index to determine how the rationing is to be done now it means that the amount of money available to the farm to undertake its projects is not sufficient and it means that the farm has several independent uh, projects that are capable of yielding positive NPVs. But then the limitation on the part of the farm is it is not able to raise the required funds to finance the projects. For this reason, the available cash, the available funds have to be uh, shared among the projects. Now we have two types of capital rationing. One we have internal or soft capital rationing and then we have the hard or external uh, capital rationing. The internal capital rationing come as a result of factors from within the organization while the internal or hard capital rationing come as a result of factors outside the uh, organization. So you can see an example of uh, perceived riskiness of the farm, uh, depressed capital budgeting, high flotation costs, or government physical policies. This can constrain the ability of a farm to raise uh, capital. So what are some of the definitions we are going to look at? Uh, one, we have the single period uh, capital rationing. This is where the limitation of capital is for only one financial period. Then we have multiple period capital rationing. This is where it is likely to persist over several financial periods. Then we have divisible projects. Uh, these are projects which can be undertaken in fractions or in portions. Then we have indivisible projects. Uh, these are projects which cannot be, uh, cannot be split. That means if you have to invest, you invest in the entire uh, project. We look at a single period capital rationing, then we look at the divisible projects. Now we have a farm here that uh, has seven projects. The seven projects available, uh, all of them have a good returns. Then the amount of money available to the farm is 500,000. Then the cost of capital of the farm is 18,000. So we have the project from A to G, and this is the initial outlay. That is the amount of money each one of them requires. This is the internal rate of return. We have already done the IRR. Then this is the estimated useful life of each one of the projects. And these are the annual cash flows, expected annual cash flows from uh, the projects. Now, uh, you are required to determine how the farm is going to share the 500,000 among the eight, uh, eight, seven projects. Now, these are the steps to follow. Step one, you compute the NPV of each project using the cost of capital of 18%. Step two, compute the profitability index of each project. Then step three, you rank the projects according to the profitability index. Then step four, you select the project to undertake according to the profitability index rankings. Then uh, in our case, we go back to project G. You notice it has an IRR of 17%. Uh, 
our cost of capital is 18%. Now this means we cannot invest in project G because the expected return from the project is lower than the cost of our capital. Therefore, we reject project G. Now we consider A to F because their expected internal rate of return is higher than the cost of our capital. So in our next step, we have already removed one project, G, so we remain with A, B, C, D, E, and, and F. Now, we provide a table like we have done here. You have the economic life, the annual cash flows, then the PV of the annuities at the rate of 18% for N years, then you have the present value, then you have the present value, that is the summation of the PVs that you have gotten here, you divide by the initial outlay, then you rank the projects, then you have the NPVs of each one of those uh, projects. We look at A. A has a useful life of five years, and uh, its cash flow is 34,140. Then the PV of annuity. Now, what I mean here is, unlike the previous table where you were looking at lump sum tables, in this one, you look at for five years. You go to your table, 18%, go to year five, the figure you get there will be 3.1272. If you go to this one, you go to year four, you will get 2.6901. 18% again, you go to year four, the same figure. You go to year three, you are getting there. You go to year five, you notice you are getting the same figure there. And you go to year four, you get the same figure. Now to get the present value, you multiply this by that, it gives you this. This by that, it gives you that. This by that, it gives you that. This by that, you get that. Then the PI. The PI, uh, you are going to divide the sum of the PVs of each project. You divide by the initial outlay. If you look at project A, the initial outlay is 90,000. And how much is our PV? 106,763. So therefore you divide 106,763 by 90,000. The answer you get is 1.19. If you look at project B, the initial outlay is 50,000. How much is now our PV there? 55,981. Therefore, you come here, 55,981, you divide by 50, gives you 1.12. You do the same for C, D, E, and, and F. Then, you compare now the answers you are getting here. Compare the answers you get under the profitability index column. The highest figure becomes number one. The second, number two. The third, number three. The fourth, number four then number five, and lastly number six. Therefore, we have ranked the projects using the answers we have gotten under the profitability uh, index. Therefore, in our investment, we should give priority to project A, then B, then C, then D, then E, then F. But then before we do that, we need to know what is the net present value of each project. Remember the computation of NPVs? Now, unlike the previous case where you divide, the PV here is 106,763. You minus 90,000. You are getting 16,763. Project B, the initial outlay is 50,000. You minus 50,000 from 55,981. You are getting 5,981. You do the same for these other projects. They will give you the NPV. Like this one, the initial outlay is 50,000 and the present value of its cash inflows is 50,009. Therefore, the NPV is 9 and all of them are positive. So we rank the projects according to that. So now, how are we going to allocate the 500,000? 
Project A requires 90,000. Let us invest 90,000 in Project A. Project B requires 50,000. We invest 50,000 in Project B. Then C requires 120. We are still remaining some money. Therefore, we continue to D. D, 200,000. We still remain with 40,000. Therefore, Project E, we only need to invest 40,000 in it. But how much does it require? Project E requires 8,000. Therefore, we are going to invest a half of that project. So invest uh, in project A, B, C, D, and a half of project uh, E. Do not invest in project F. Now, what would be your net present value if you do that? You add the NPVs we have been computing. The answer comes to 39,770. Therefore, if you do that, you will be able to optimally allocate the 500,000 among your projects. Now this one is showing how we got the 919 here. Project E requires 8,000 and we have said we are investing only 40,000. Therefore, we multiply the NPV for that. If you go back there, you will see the NPV for E was 1838. Therefore, we are getting 919. Now, uh, we have some discussion questions that you are going to focus on uh, regarding this topic. Uh, first one is you discuss the administration issues in investment decisions. Then the other one is you discuss the relevant cash flows in investment decisions. Then you discuss how the following are methods. You discuss how the following methods are used in business to measure the risks in capital budgeting. One is standard deviation, then we have the coefficient of variation, then we have a variance. If you do that, you'll get uh, 12 marks. So that marks the end of today's lesson. Uh, thank you for listening. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.